I am Bill Cortright with Living Right with Bill Cortright. And this is the Stress Mastery Podcast, where we take you from the science to the spirituality of stress mastery. Hello, and welcome to the Stress Mastery Podcast. I'm your host, Peggy Romero. Thank you so much for joining me today. This week, we've been doing interviews on all five life categories that we talk about in Stress Mastery. So today, we will continue that with relationships. I have a great guest today. He's a best-selling author. His name's Tom Zeman. His relationship book is titled Creating the Relationship of Your Dreams, How to Manifest It from Fantasy to Reality. I want to give you a little background on Tom and I. I met him in 2008, so we actually have a relationship of our own. At that time, I was an all-state agency owner, and he worked for a glass company, you know, Auto Glass. So he was a sales rep for that company, and they offered windshield replacement for our insurance. So that kind of marketing is actually all about relationships, creating them, making them deeper and deeper, getting to know the client, which was me. If you want me to send you my beloved clientele, you're going to have to show me that they're going to be respected and that you offer a great service. So that was Tom's job. He had to establish enough rapport in hopes of finding common ground with all these different agents. Tom's a really likable guy. He seemed to do that easily, not only with me, but the other agents in my area. Tom's very self-aware and he admits himself that he isn't for everyone. He's really intense, but he is for me. I got to say, he was a little hard for me to get used to at first, but I learned him. Started out slow, but we must have gotten somewhat close because over the years we began to hug. Well, let me rephrase that. He taught me how to hug. According to the Z-Man, you have to hug to the left. I think it's to the left. This makes your hearts beat together because they meet in the middle. So let's just say I wasn't into personal development at all at that time. So I thought that was kind of weird. I didn't know anything about being out of stress back then. I didn't even try. Didn't know a thing about stress mastery. Tom, I assumed, could see that I was completely stressed out businesswoman and constantly invited me to his home. He wanted to teach me how to meditate. You guys talk about the death effect. I was so close to any idea of growth, even though I had heard that yoga and meditation and all that brings inner peace. I didn't want any part of it. Couldn't even hear him. Couldn't even consider it. Looking back at my narrow mindedness kind of cracks me up now. I hate to admit that I was actually afraid that him getting me to his house for meditation would be like his first step of getting this nice Christian girl into Buddhism. I kid you not. So there you have it. He didn't give up on me after all that craziness. And he's been a great support to me. In fact, he was the first one I called for advice when I decided to write my own book. He's a wonderful friend to me and a great overall guy. So without further ado, Please meet Thomas E. Zeman, best-selling author. Hey, Tom, how the heck are you? Oh, my God. Um, with, with accolades like that, can I just go home right now? I don't know if I could live <laughs> up I'm on such, such a high pedestal. Mm-hmm. Uh, but thank you, and um, it's, it's wonderful to be here. Yeah, I, was, I thought we had known each other for way, way long time, and not to go into Buddhism hinduism or anything that talks about reincarnation but it felt it feels like we've known each other for many lifetimes so i felt immediately comfortable with you and i'm a touchy-feely guy and yeah when we learned how to hug our heart (laughs) chakras needed to needed to uh be in contact so there is a proper way to hug for full benefits yeah anyway regardless okay (laughs) yeah so anyways thank you so much for doing the podcast with me um our listeners are familiar with the life categories that we talk about. So I thought you were perfect for me to interview for relationships since you are a best-selling author on relationships. And then I know that you also have some um, other books that you've written. So what got you into personal development to start with? You know, that's a great question. And I'll do the reader's digest version. I was the kid that everyone loved to pick on in high, in junior high and high school. I was, uh, small, still, st- still the shorter guy, right? Height challenged um, and a know-it-all. So I wasn't very popular. I was a kid that people loved to, to beat up. So I always wanted to get into the martial arts, but never did. And I finally learned how to take a little care of myself in high school where they weren't picking on me anymore. But the long story short was after I graduated, um, I met a man who changed my life. I was working at a Nautilus um, 
Nautilus facility, and it was the new thing back in the 80s. I was working in the north side of Chicago at Lakeside Center, and I was an instructor. And that day, when Johnny Norman came in, he he wasn't really that tall, but he was built like a, like a refrigerator. And he looked like a lion. I mean, he was a Leo, too, uh, for whatever that <laughs> is. When he laughed, he would like roar. Oh. <laughs> and he was great. And he came in, and I'm making chit-chat, showing on the machines and stuff, and asked him what he did. And he said, well, he said, I'm a counselor in Chicago public schools. I go, oh. He says, I also run a martial arts studio. And all of a sudden, my eyes are like, whoa. It's, it's like... I don't believe in serendipity. I believe that things happen for a reason, happy accidents. And all of a sudden I was swooning. It's like, wow, this guy's cool. And I go, you know, I, I'm trying to like to hold back my enthusiasm. And I said, you know, I've always wanted to, uh, to come. He goes, well, what are you doing tonight? <laughs> oh. I went that night and I never stopped going until I was in the Navy. Now, uh, the reason I bring this up is to tell you what's special about uh, Johnny Norman is he's a Taoist master similar to Buddhism I'm not going to go I I know enough to be dangerous to talk about different religions and stuff but I can tell you about his background was Taoism and he taught a, a style of Shaolin Kung Fu that's my absolute favorite Kung Fu now what he loved about the American schools Peggy is that they taught a great art the, the hard arts like Taekwondo and Karate and the softer arts um, as well but he didn't feel that they did a great job with the spiritual aspect, with the meditation, meditative side of all these, the spiritual side of it. Mm -hmm. So every class that he taught ended with a different type of meditation. Now, before we go any further, I'm going to continue the story. But really, I, when I talk about meditation to people or ask questions, really, um, I get like a doe in a headlight look. I, it it, it kind of worries some people, like my Christian friends, and what like, when I, like you, when we first started, you know, like I would hold and I'm, I'm going to jump back here because I tend to jump around and, and get very enthusiastic about this. But I would hold satsang. Satsang is an old Hindu word. Sat means truth. Sang means gathering, just like Johnny Norman did Sundays at his house when he would teach different aspect of Eastern philosophies. In fact, his whole um his, his whole powwow, his whole life was Eastern philosophies with a Western mind. In fact, that was the name of his, his dojo was East West martial arts. So he would share this and he would have people from all over the North side of Chicago and further come to his house and he would, he would do the satsang and do the guided meditation. When I met you in 2008, you gotta be careful. I'm doing business to business marketing. Um, I'm not for everybody as our buddy, Mark Skinner would tell you. Um, and but once you see that I, I actually love you and uh, I try to be real on it, it, you can let me in a little bit, but I didn't really know you, you held your cards. You were a very a shrewd businesswoman. You were successful. I mean, I knew you were doing, you're going to do things and to, to your credit this day, other agents want what you had and what you brought to the table. You probably talked about that in other podcasts, but you were good. I know there was something special about you, um, but you were go, go, go. And I thought, you know, I'm going to take a chance. Um, <laughs> you were standoffish with me, right? Didn't you want to like hug or shake hands and stuff? So I invited you to a satsangs. Yeah, like what John, I could never hold a candle to Johnny. He knew probably 400 different meditations. I know probably five that I can actually do with eloquence. He would always end his that way. And how, where am I going with all this? You asked in your questions, because I always like to have questions before we start where we're going to go. So we have like a basis for what so I don't come in cold to this and I don't have to wing it. We talk about success. Well, what got you going? Well, that was the first thing is um, the spiritual aspect, which I really lacked. I mean, sure, I'd gone to a Lutheran school for a number of years in, in my younger days, but wasn't really practicing or anything. And he opened me up to a whole new idea of spiritual. He got me to read. He got me to get my library card turned me on to books like the Tao Te Ching, um, the Baha Gita, um, uh, the, the Book of Life and Death, um, wonderful books, and people like Alan Watts. And even after when I, so that, that was the start. When I went, then I was getting ready to go in the Navy. He gave me one advice. He said, he goes, I know you're going to go overseas, Tom. He says, 
he goes, you want to go see the martial arts studios? He said, find people who can speak English and go to the temples. He goes, and listen to them and take notes. He goes, I've seen your handwriting and it's hideous. He gave me this beautiful leather <laughs> bound boundary and started writing notes. Nice. That's the, that was the start of the writing. That, that really was the start um, on it. 32 year, years later from that point is I actually finally had enough confidence to publish the Department of Zenitation, um, making spirituality work in a lay- layman's guide to making spirituality work, right? That's another for another topic, but I never stopped writing that book and all the napkins and stuff that I wrote on and little pieces <laughs> of paper had over six, 7,000 quotes mantras, maxims that I just loved. Look, so I got out of the Navy and I'm feeling very vainglorious. I served my country. I'm living at my aunt's house in her basement, not doing much, enjoying beers. And I had a buddy who saw this and he said something that changed my life. He said, hey, what are you doing tonight? He said, other than drinking Z, Z man. I said, I don't know why grinding at me all of a sudden you know my my dobermans are up you know what what is he He says um because i'm going to this class about gold he specifically said gold and i'm going well gold i like gold (laughs) i'm going wow you know i've always wanted to be like a metal detector and i had dreams of like going into mine and finding gold right so i said all right so i show up i'm in my jeans and my you know um my my kind of ripped up jeans and my shirt and i come into this room and all of a sudden, I'm seeing all these Natalie dressed people, nice suits, all sitting there like many couples, notepads in hand, and this very beautifully dressed speaker who was running it um, starts talking about, I had no idea I was brought to an Amway meeting. Right? Oh. <laughs> but it was so, I just found it so intriguing, the ideas. It wasn't a sell. They didn't, he didn't try to sell anything, but he turned me on to things I had never heard of, like stuff by James Allen, Jim Rome, Napoleon Hill, Claude and Bristol. And my mind was just going a million miles an hour. Of course, he wanted me, me to be in his downline, but he, he, something started within me and he sent me home with a reading list that night of like tons of books, much like what Johnny Norman had done. And I started that's what got me into the the success and success motivational institute earl nightingale the strangest secret i mean i can go on that that was it however i didn't quite have my anger dragon under control until i was actually ready to see myself in an unflattering life and if when i'm working with coaching with people all over the world it's the one that if i can give them tough love and and say stuff when i can get to that point that I just tell them, I go, um, do I have permission to do this with you? And if I feel like I do, I tell them, number one, you got to be able to see yourself in an unflattering light. It's the only way that the real growth for me, and I never tell you I'm right. As long as you've known me, Peggy, have I ever said I'm right? I'm My way is the only way? Be no, honest. I don't think I don't think you ever have. I don't want to do that because I know so very what works for me might not be true for you. And exactly. in fact, if you, if you vehemently disagree, with anything that I say, that's good. You know why it's good? Because it means you know yourself or you have an idea. But just the fact that you're willing to be open to it. I mean, think about where you were before, Peggy, not in thinking that because you meditate that it's going to take you away from Christianity. Jesus Christ was one of the greatest meditators of all time. Mm-hmm. He could meditate for hours. In fact, he would get mad at his disciples when he went up on and was at Mount Olive, he went to a mount. And he was, it was one of the few times he ever got angry that I know of any stories of him um, is when his disciples fell asleep. He was meditating. Yeah. He was meditating. He got meditating. He got angry too. The other time he got angry that we know about was when the money collectors were in front of the, his, his Lord's, his, his, his father's father. house. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. You're right. I'm much more open-minded than I was. I was so, I guess, uh, fearful of anything that went against my religious programming and I was more the one that was like it's my way it's this this is the only way sure so, yeah so yeah you're right about that <laughs> I've learned a lot since then come a long way 
done great. You, you, you've actually been a treasure trove, a treasure trove of wisdom for myself and many people. And you're unique because you um, you can sh share your ideas in a non-sectarian, non-threatening way. You'll just throw it out there. I mean, even when you were selling insurance, you weren't pounding on people for life insurance. Although you know your your TAM may have wanted you to, you know, and you didn't yeah. sell <laughs> stuff because you could. You sold it if it made sense. You know, if it made sense, I respected, I respected that about your practice. Thank you. Um, okay, let me ask you the next question. Um, that is no surprise because I sent them to you. So back to talking about the meditation. Yes. Because I want to get this with relationships. Do you find that meditation is useful to helping you with your relationships and how so? Excellent question. First, we want, I want to define meditation, Peggy, and I'm going to put you on the spot here. Go ahead. In 10 words or less, what is meditation? Uh, for me, meditation is connection with God. I couldn't have said it more eloquently. <laughs> and when I say God, you know, that that's kind of makes people shudder. I think I, when I say God, I think of source. I think of uh, universe. Yeah. yeah. So we'll, we'll just leave it. To that. And yeah, it's a connection with that. But yet, when you think about meditation, and I wrote about this in, in all three books, is that meditation is, it, there's there's thousands, literally hundreds of different types of meditation. There's the kind when you are actually guided where you'll listen and just follow along. There's silent meditations, very um, prevalent in Buddhism. There's meditations when you will just go out in the desert or up on a hill and just experience that with nature. Um, when you're doing artwork, it's a type of meditation when you're listening to music. If you have a hobby, something that you absolutely love, and all of a sudden you look up and it's three hours later and you've just been engulfed in that, that's a different type of meditation. So it's it's finding what type of meditation works for you and then doing something every day, making time for it, even if it's just five minutes. And the easiest meditation in the world, and this is this is the greatest one that I've ever done. And it sounded so simple when I first heard it. And it's focus on your breath. And you, you think oh, yeah. about it. That's how I started too. There focus you go. So focus yeah. on your breath. There's a great uh, PhD, Dr. John Schinnener. And I never say his name right. This guy's got a podcast of 10,000 people. He, he, he's amazing. And he does about anger stuff. And that's why we're involved and he works with people. But we talk, he talks when he teaches about the breathing meditation I used to say the four, four, four. That's four, four. You breathe it on four. Hold it for four. And then let it out on fourth. And he took it one step further. And I like his. He said, do four, four, eight or four, four, twelve. If I remember from our podcast where the, it's really letting it out long. And it's amazing. When we talk about energies, when we talk about the anxiousness, the angst that we have. And to be able to, they, people say, well, that's the hardest part, Tom. You know, it's, it's um, you know, the monkey mind, which we can talk a little about later. But to be able to calm that breath, for me, has worked like a charm. When we talk about energies, uh, we'll, we'll talk about a little Hinduism here. The energy starts at the base of the spine and it goes in, in circular motion. So when we're angry and angst and, and filled with, with jitters, it's, it's flowing erratically. With our breath, we can control that, help that flow up the Shishkona through the crown to, to the sun center, all the way down throat chakra into Dantian. So we can have that flow and we can do it with breath. And it's amazing how your breath, for me, and again, I never, in anything I've ever written, in any, in any of my podcasts, and in my YouTube, I never say I'm right. I say I'm right for me. This works for me. So the breathing, that four, four, eight, if you take anything away from Peggy's um, podcast today, try that for yourself and see if it works. So that, that meditation. So coming up to that, to me, until I was ready to deal, even, even before the meditation, until I was ready to deal with the anger part of me, something that I've been seething my anger dragon for years to figure out where the anger was coming from. And it actually was because of this anger, this, um, this pissed off that I had from my father of all crazy things. Once I forgave him, there's another key, forgiveness. 
We don't do it because the other person deserves it. We do it to give ourselves peace. Once I forgave him, holy cow, it's like huge boulders were lifted off my shoulders and I could also forgive myself. My, in the book of relationships on the cover, it looks like a kind of a Harlequin Daniel Steele novel with you know the ghost on top of it, like the Patrick Swayze and the Demi Moore on top of each other. And it looks like that, but really, and in, for creating the relationship of your dreams, when you look at that, like when you're marketing, on, on, you have eight seconds, according to the experts on Amazon, where they're going to look at you before they'll even read the subtitle mm-hmm. on it. I wanted to catch that group, but really creating the relationship of your dreams begins within. That's the key. If you gain awareness, hate, right? Pardon me? Aware, well, awareness, being aware of yourself. And like you were talking about your being, oh, it was my dad of all crazy things. If you never figured that out, if you couldn't become aware of what was making you so pissed, you could have never pulled yourself out of it. So that's what I was thinking you meant. You're exactly correct. And it's seeing, being willing to finally see myself in an unflattering light. But I'm going to ask you a question right here. And this goes out to all the readers too, because when I'm speaking in groups of like large or even small, or even in dinner parties, I'll ask this one question. If I feel like I have a receptive audience, it's, it's all about timing and knowing what to ask is I ask do you love, and I'll ask this to you, Peggy. Do you love yourself more than anything else in the world? Um, I'm just starting to right now. That is the best answer that I, I love hearing that because when I ask that to people, people are shocked. Some people are like a doe in a headlight. <laughs> people can't allow that. And I'm not talking a narcissistic love. I'm talking giving you the love that no one else can. I'm talking that love of the connection. If you want to talk about in Christianity, the love of the creator, if you want to, mm-hmm. if, if you want to be to that, no one can give us that more than ourselves. That's my, my opinion, just my belief. When you can get to that point, then your other relationships blossom. And I'm not just talking romantic relationships. I'm talking relationships with your kids, with your coworkers, you're going to have different relationships. And love is such a multifaceted tool. The love I have for you, Peggy, um, it would be different than the love I would have for my cats. And I have a lot or the different. The love <laughs> I know how much love you have for your cats. <laughs> oh my God. So it's, but it's all, it's the same multifaceted gem that, that shines in so many different aspects, but it's still the core is that love. When we can get to that loving aspect with ourselves, that's, that's the secret. That's the key. That's what's going to open up the myriad of possibilities. That's going to change your life. And whether you're, whether you want to have a romantic relationship, whether you want to have it just as a platonic, I have friends who love being single and they couldn't, and there's people who I know who have open relationships and it works for them. Hey, if it works for them, they're not hurt anybody. Great. Um, the key is that relationship, once it's instilled with you and you, you've seen it right now, you've seen the miraculous changes that you have with yourself. And you can speak to this and you probably have on your podcast that I am um, ashamed that I haven't heard and I promise to listen to them. It's on my to-do list. Um, you probably already addressed that. When that happens, the floodgates of opportunity is open. But just because that you you want it, the, the, the problem that I see and that I hear, and you can agree or disagree with me on this, Peggy, is that people, we want something. We have a thirst for something, but we can't eloquently state specifically with specificity what it is. And that's the subconscious. That is what a lot of the success books that I talk about, the subconscious, to me, it doesn't speak in words, but, and it makes a terrible, it makes a terrible leader, but a wonderful servant if you know how to utilize it. One way to do that is through visualization, another meditation, right? Actually, and I love this from, I, it may have been Earl Nightingale, and I think it was, act as if the thing in question is real already. The subconscious cannot differentiate between what is vividly imagined and actually exists. Maslow talked about that, Napoleon Hill, all the same. So that's, that's, how, we, that's how I talk to my, to my anger dragon. And believe me, there's a lot of anger drag. There's a lot of dragons we have within us. My great friend, Dr. Steve McSwain, wonderful Christian leader guy, books. And he just says, Tom, because I had him read the book, you know, and um, I was very nervous when I put my first book out. It took me 32 years to finish the doggone thing because I never had <laughs> enough confidence to believe it was going to be good enough. 
took 10 from 10,000 quotes. It came down to a thousand. And he's, and he, when he wrote it, he loved it. And he said, um, he said, Tom, he goes, truth is, and I'm paraphrasing. The truth is there's many dragons that we're dealing with. And everybody we know, Peggy, is dealing with a different dragon and dealing with a different fire, a little act of kindness. We don't know until we walk in our friend's moccasins what stripes and problems that they're dealing with. And again, once we can deal with our own crap and to be okay with it mm -hmm. and to accept ourselves and to forgive ourselves and to work like you are working every day diligently to become an even be Betty better Peggy Romero, that, that's critical. That's key. And that that's where, and there's going to be up and downs. There's not, it, there's, there's no utopia here. Life is never meant to be fair. And we've got to roll with, with the slings and arrows, as Shakespeare would say. We've got to roll with those punches and just figuring out how we can do that. And not to, when, when I'm calling on you business to business marketing, I think Jim Rome said it. He says, when you're going in to make these calls, you leave all your problems in your briefcase in your car and you come in and, hey, I'm the showman. Yeah. I'm the Marty Hall. And no, I'm not for everybody. Mark Skinner, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tom, okay, so we only have a few more minutes. Um, do you have three tips that you can give somebody who does want to create the relationship of their dreams? Um, I'm yeah. thinking know yourself first. Is that what you're going to say? Uh, you're exactly right. Uh, first, your first was to love yourself completely. And that's mm -hmm. going to be tough for people. They think that it's a sin or it's selfish. It's yeah. If they, yeah, selfish. Oh, I, I, I have to do this. Um, if I don't love my kids more, something's wrong with me. Well, let's use an analogy. You've been on a plane before, Peggy. You're a jet setter. You've flown, right? It's mm -hmm. always the same spiel, whether you're flying Southwest, American, Al uh, Pan Am. Alaska. Alaska, <laughs> one of my favorites, right? Too. It's always the same. It's it, what does the flight attendant say if you're you're riding with an elderly or a young kid? They don't oh, tell to put them. on your own mask first before you try to help somebody else, right? That's right. And Jesus said the same thing. He said, you know, if you're trying to cast aspersions on someone, take the plank out of your own eye first. That's a different story on here, but it works along the same mm -hmm. the same mantra. We must take care of ourselves first to be able to really give that love to be able to do that. So yeah, the first thing is love yourself. Okay. Number two for me was knowing exactly what I wanted. We all know we want something, but do you have it written down? Working out of your mind is kind of like going into a desert with a teaspoon when the ones, when, when the one shower comes out and trying to catch it, when you have a bucket, when you have a thing to be able to write stuff down and so that you can go over it and look at it, it's, it, you're going to get, far greater results, but then the work comes. You have to be able to willing to do the work, something every day after you decide. So let me ask you this question, since we're talking about success here. What, what is success, Peggy? Um, I think for success for me is to be able to live in peace. I just wanna do what I wanna do and just be living in a level of energy of peace not stressed out, not striving, not pushing, not fighting for it, but just doing it, being it, and being at peace with what I'm doing. I love that. I love that's that. Situation. And we can walk down the street to a hundred different people if they can even eloquently say that so quickly. Um, and you get a hundred different answers. And guess what? The person spouting it is correct. I like Earl Nightingale's definition that success is the progressive realization of a worthy ideal success wow. is the progressive realization of where they ideal. In other words, someone who is working predeterminately towards a goal that they have set, they're a success. A success is a wife and mother because she chose to be a wife and mother. She's doing something every day to get by it. You're a success, Peggy, because other agents, all state agents are calling on you to have you help them in their books of business um, what made you successful? So you're successful and success has, I really think it goes in every aspect of our life. When we talk about Maslow and the hierarchy of needs, you have eight different um, levels that he talked about. We talk about mental, physical, emotional, spiritual, social, financial, family, and 
Last one. Oh, I don't know. And being successful in all those aspects of the wheel. And to be able to look at every aspect of our life, the center of the wheel is 0%. The outside would be 100%. When he talked about becoming fully self-actualized, but be able to, if you could put that on a wheel and create spokes and where you are exactly at this moment, you can look at yourself and you can actually, if you see yourself truthfully, you can see the areas in life where you can use some help. You've got a successful businessman, for example. The guy is uh, super successful, got all these businesses, but he's let his emotions um, very cold and he's left his family life, which he says he works so hard for, um, just fizzle out because he didn't focus on that aspect. He went after the money, but then after he got that, then what does he have left? Right. Yeah. That, that might be for somebody. That might be what their success is. It's, that's it for them. As long as they know it, great. Right. Um, yeah. In uh, stress mastery, we <laughs> believe that you have to keep raising up in all five life categories. Otherwise, the one, like you said, it's just going to keep pulling you back down, pulling you back down. You're never going to really... I mean, you might feel successful, but it's only in that category. Like when you knew me before, yeah, I was really successful in my business, but my relationships were suffering because I took more time than what I should have for my business. So yeah, stuff like that uh, really is stuff to think about as far as what success is to you, because how can you say, oh, I'm really successful in my life if you're... 50 pounds overweight and had a heart attack last week because you're under so much stress because you're successful at work. <laughs> the man goes so. out, I, think, I think Jim Rome said it best. He said, the man goes out to change the world and he has not swept his own floor. Who's he keeping? Right. <laughs> right. Okay. So Tom, I'm um, wrapping up. I want you to tell them about your uh, books. Um, the other, you know, all three of them uh, in case they want to listen because you are uh, really spot on a lot of your stuff that you're saying, even though you don't listen to our podcast yet. Um, you're spot on with stress mastery on many levels on many of the stuff you that you said. So um, our listeners might be very interested in reading your books. So quick uh, little 30 second commercial for each one. Oh, thank you. Well, if you like this, go to go to my YouTube, TomZeman.com. We can talk about it. The first book. All these are available on Amazon, the Department of Zenitation, 32 years to complete. It's what I found to be for me, which was the absolute best of all truths that are in the world. Whatever, whatever you find to be true, that's for you. You might enjoy it. It's mm -hmm. got over 165 different chaplets that talk about truth and love and success and relationships. The next one is something I had to deal with was my anger dragon. The second book is Taming the Anger Dragon from pissed off to peaceful. And what I did, it was my struggle um, to get to where I am now. It helped me get the relationship of my dreams started within and now with my lovely wife, Michelle. In my third book, who helped me write that book, Creating the Relationship of Your Dreams, How to Manifest it from Fantasy to Reality. Yay, good job, Tom. Tom's a best-selling author, so well worth the read. I used to keep the Department of Zenitation in my lobby at my Allstate agency. And people would just pick it up and go, wow, that book out there is pretty cool. So oh, thank it. you, Peggy. Worth a read. Yeah, thank you uh, for being here with me today. So guys, that's it for today's show. I thank you for listening. Our mission here is to create a shift in the planet. You can join us on that mission by simply like, share, and subscribe. The links are right below the show. Thanks again. Until next time, stay inspired. Bye.